Good afternoon, everyone, uh, except for those of you in Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Janet Topolsky, and I'm Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group. And I want to welcome all of you to our fourth road session, Virtual Exchange. Today, the topic is Opportunity Makers Melding Health and Equity in Rural Places. And what I'd like to do now is talk to you about what we're going to do. But before I do that, I want to I want to thank and and congratulate and be happy about today's event partners, the people who have traditionally been bringing you the road sessions, the rural opportunity and development sessions, are our program community strategies group at the Aspen Institute, the Housing Assistance Council, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, and Rural Lisk. And the four of us really conceived of this series and are continuing to stage it. We're really excited today to have an additional partner or a set of partners here, the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, as well as the program that they manage, the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. And you're going to hear from uh, someone who actually works there as part of this uh, webinar. Now, why are we doing these series, this Rural Opportunity Development Series? We really started it around uh, when COVID hit, uh, but we are planning on working together this year anyway. What we really want to do together this year and going on is to highlight and unpack ideas and strategies that are working in rural and that are critical in building rural. Bo uh, that was true before COVID. It's true now even more so in terms of long-term recovery. Um, we want to feature what practitioners are doing on the ground because we really think the learning that that is needed on what will make things better for both rural and urban America and all of America has to do with learning from the people doing the work on the ground. We wanna bring their wisdom and savvy to the fore. We want people to understand fully the range of conditions as well as the range of people who live in rural America. So we're lifting a, a range of voices through these series. We're spotlighting assets and challenges in rural we want to infuse the stories of what's really going on into narratives about rural nationally and internationally. And we want to strengthen the networking of organizations that are actually doing work in rural, which is really happening um, because you're all meeting each other both here with the stories that you hear in the road sessions, but also in the breakout sessions. Clifford? So the way this session is gonna work is we're gonna have this panel discussion and conversation for this first hour. And then for all of you who want to, we really recommend that you join in then in the breakout rooms, which will be from four to 4.30 uh, Eastern time. Uh, when you join the breakout, you'll meet others, you have more opportunity. That's a regular Zoom session. So you can ask questions, you can get advice, you can ask questions of one of the, one of the panel as well. And today we're going to have a new thing, which is Jamboards, where we're going to ask you also to write what you think about uh, certain what will it take questions. And so that's uh, how this is going to go. Uh, during this first hour, though, please use the chat box if you want to share any insight or if you want to echo something that a speaker said. Sometimes people like to use the chat box to say yes. Um, and also, you can also, if you prefer to use the Q&A box, you can do that to ask questions of your speakers. Um, and you know, during this first hour, probably most of the Q&A part will be in the last 15 minutes. And then in the um, breakout sessions in the next half hour, you'll be all on screen and you can open the phone, so to speak, and talk. So now um, a little bit more housekeeping. Your mics are muted. Would, I saw someone already asked that in the chat. If you have any tech issues, please use the chat box. We've got people standing by to address. When you do go into the breakout session, let me remind you that that's a separate link. And uh, during the session at the end, uh, Clifford, who is behind the scenes making this all work, is going to put it in the chat box. But you also received an email with that link already. And that link's going to be sent again during this hour <laughs> to every registered participant's email. So there are three ways you can find the breakout link. If you haven't received it, send a note to csg.program at aspeninstitute.org. And uh, finally, before we move on to the uh, content here, the recordings of this first hour will be available on the Aspen CSG event webpage in the next few days. It will also be sent to all of you who are registered. 
So with that, what I think I want to do is just welcome today's moderator and first of all, introduce her. Uh, I want to mention also that part of the reason we chose to do this topic this week is because November 19th, next Thursday is National Rural Health Day. And it seemed a perfect time to talk about health equity and development in rural America. And we're so thrilled to have as our moderator, Kara James, who is president and CEO of Grantmakers in Health, which is a, an organization um, that helps foundations and corporate giving programs improve health. They have 230 members and they're doing work all the time to figure out how do we improve health and health equity in this country. Before Kara was at Grantmakers in Health, she was director of the Office of Minority Health at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, often known as CMS at, at the US Department of Health and Human Services. And, and what she spent time doing there was really focusing on reducing disparities and increasing health equity for vulnerable populations, especially racial populations, ethnic, persons with disabilities, sexual and gender minorities, and also persons living in rural communities. Um, and she, while she was there, she developed the first rural health strategy for that agency, as well as the first um, equity plan, health equity plan. So we're thrilled also to have her as a member of the National Advisory Committee for our initiative in partnership with the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. And that initiative is called Thrive Rural with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Thrive Rural is focused on what will it take for communities and native nations across the rural United States to be healthy places where everyone belongs, lives with dignity and thrives. And I know Kara cares about the same thing. So I'm gonna turn it over to her to start talking to us about what she knows about that and then to moderate the panel. Thank you, Kara. Thank you so much, Janet. And good afternoon and good morning to those of you who are joining us, um, as Janet said, a little further uh, to the West. I um, am very pleased to be joining our panelists today and I will talk about them in a little bit to focus on our conversation for today, which really in this um, Rhodes session, as Janet highlighted, provides those practical stories from on the ground practitioners who have experience, wisdom and savvy to share and um, talk about some of the assets and challenges. And I can't think of three better people to share the, uh, screen with, if you will, than who we have today. And our particular session is focusing on the issue of rural health and hospitals as catalysts for opportunity. And I know that for many of you, I don't need to talk about the importance of rural hospitals as the center and cornerstone of communities and development. They are obviously not only the place where so many people go to get care, but they also tend to be the largest employers in those communities and a community anchor. They can help to bring business to the community and, um, and also work to improve health outcomes. And some of the stories you're gonna to hear today are gonna to reflect on some of those, those issues. But we also know as we think about the equity and diversity aspects of this that a number of rural hospitals are struggling. And today we have 50% of rural hospitals that are in financial distress, a number that have closed. And for those communities, access to care can be even a greater challenge than it already is for rural communities. And we know that for a number of those communities, it's been disproportionately impacting rural communities of color. Um, so it's one of those reasons that we look at the intersection and uh, in our blog that we wrote uh, just last month or technically in September, we talked about the importance of rural and racial equity folks working together to create a force multiplier. And why is that important? Well, we find that often these two groups end up um, not having a seat at the table they face similar challenges related to health, health care and the social determinants of health disproportionately impacted um, by having lower incomes, less educational attainment and other challenges related to food and housing, as well as typically struggling to get the data needed to help tell their story and struggling to get a seat at the table among some of the other challenges that they face. And we need more people who are looking and focusing on these issues and coming together to develop solutions that are unique to the communities that they face. 
And again, you're gonna hear some of that from our speakers today. Um, we have um, with us, and I'm gonna turn to our speakers in just a minute so we can really get going, um, three wonderful individuals who are really talented and know a lot in this space, starting with um, Lawrence Brown, who is Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute in Madison, Wisconsin. And following um, Dr. Brown will be Josh Martin, who is the CEO of Summit Pacific Medical Center in Washington State. And rounding it out will be Maria Arnott, who is with the Williamson Health and Wellness Center. And she was previously the immediate past director of community agriculture at the center in Williamson, West Virginia. So we're gonna crisscross the country and hear some really innovative ideas of how um, these three have been working to improve rural health and health outcomes. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Brown to get us going. Dr. Brown, you're on mute. All right, now I'm off of mute. Good day to everyone. So glad to be here um, and discuss uh, the context. You know, everybody likes data. So I wanna show you a few slides to let you know what's going on in rural counties across America. So we start with this slide here. Uh, you can see these different colors that indicate what type of county we're talking about in terms of size uh, and how it's classified. So you have uh, those large urban metro counties in orange, suburban counties in yellow, smaller metros in green, and our beautiful rural counties in blue. And what's really interesting is that the total population of rural counties is roughly 46 million people. So the smallest out of the different classifications, but many, many more counties. In fact, there are more rural counties than all the other three categories combined. So you're talking about the distribution of a smaller number of people spread out over a wider space compared to the other categories of urbanization. And so I want to share a little bit of data uh, so we can see where do rural counties fall as it relates to multiple categories. So first, let's look at health infrastructure. Whether you're talking about primary care physicians or dentists, rural health counties have the least access when it comes to those health and dental professionals. Uh, when you look at utilization for hospital stays, uh, folks in rural counties have a higher rate of preventable hospital stays, therefore, therefore really sort of highlighting uh, more challenges around health and more challenges around access. So then, which it then makes sense that there are issues like more adult obesity in rural counties and uh, perhaps uh, one can imagine uh, not having the best access to the type of foods that are needed uh, if you're not living and eating directly from the farm, uh, that can be an issue. And then if we look at economic indicators, there's higher levels of unemployment in rural counties, higher levels of children living in poverty in those rural counties. So these are some of the challenges that our rural counties are facing. We also know that uh, our rural counties across the country are dealing with the opioid pan ep well, epidemic uh, as we call it, but also I think as the paper uh, authors here call it syndemics, that there are multiple ways in which opioids are really damaging communities. So you could be dealing with prescription opioid issues, synthetic opioid issues, uh, fentanyl, of course, uh, heroin is another issue. And so you can see how that plays out differently across different states. Uh, if you zoom into Appalachia, as you see there at the bottom, uh, you see West Virginia, Ohio, Western Maryland, and then even further up in the Northeast, those states are really struggling in their rural counties dealing with uh, different types of opioid uh, epidemics. Uh, states like Tennessee and Nevada uh, have a high degree of prescription opioid issues. Uh, Oklahoma, you can see there as well. Utah uh, has that, and then a mixture with those synthetics as well, New Mexico, you can see, especially the northern part of the state there, uh, also dealing with the syndemic. So these multiple ways, multiple forms of opioids 
that those counties are facing there. And it looks like if you look at Illinois, Missouri, the border there, uh, there are also a few counties there facing the opioid syndemic. So when we think about the capacity of rural counties to address these problems, we have to think about their local health departments. And so this paper, uh, the double disparity facing rural uh, health, rural local health departments really sort of gives a good overview of the challenges that these health departments face. So uh, we see that they lack the capacity to really engage in those 10 essential public health services that you see in the model on the right. Uh, of course, if you don't have a large staff, if you don't have the funding as many of our public health departments are deeply underfunded, uh, then you're not gonna be able to carry out these multiple services for folks in your county. Um, and then there's the lack of specialty staff. Of course, that's also playing an issue if you don't have the epidemiologists that are needed to really dive into the data that's gonna present an issue in terms of making sure your work and your services are really targeted. Uh, we see that they have to rely on partnerships like the hospitals that Kara mentioned earlier, uh, but in a rural county, you don't have a lot of partners depending on where you are. You may not have the plethora of options that you might find in an urban area where there might be foundations and nonprofits galore, uh, limited numbers in rural health counties. And then also the technology limitations uh, the, the lack of access to the latest evidence, training opportunities, and quality improvement materials. So these all sort of paint a picture of the capacity issues that many rural local public health departments face. And then we see also that, as Kara mentioned earlier, uh, many hospitals are closing in rural areas uh, and that the problem is actually getting worse uh, since uh, roughly 2012. Uh, you can see many of those hospital closures are concentrated in the Deep South. And we have to think that these are also counties that uh, opted against taking the Medicaid expansion related to the Patient, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. So they aren't receiving the funding, the additional funding that came with that expansion and not able to provide the revenue for those hospitals to stay afloat. So that's a big issue from a policy standpoint. And then also when you deal with rural counties, many of these, pop, many of these counties have declining populations. Uh, so they may not have the tax revenue, the tax base to help support some of these hospitals. Like my uh, home county, Crittenden County, Arkansas, that was an issue that, that was faced. Although thankfully, even though our hospital closed in Crittenden County, Arkansas, we were able to attract another one uh, that opened a couple of years later. So this is a big issue. And I, should say this is also an issue in urban areas. So just to highlight what Kara was talking about, this is one of those issues where you could actually find some perhaps commonality. And then uh, looks like on the next slide, uh, what we have is, even though you see these challenges, uh, what we have with county health rankings is our theory of change, which really highlights how program staff, interventions, local health departments, hospitals, can work to impact those health outcomes and decrease those gaps uh, as it relates to health disparities. And so if you have folks that are really lifting up the evidence, the data, the stories, the narratives to folks in rural counties that they can drive attention to the issues that those social determinants that Kara talked about, the factors that drive disparities between different groups in our society. And when we do that, we can shift mindsets uh, with folks in our communities, get multiple folks and organizations to collaborate and use those uh, policies and practices, use the evidence to inform those policies and practices that are needed to improve health outcomes. So we've actually put some work together, a great report, what works, strategies to improve rural health. Check out that report, has a lot of goodies in it, a lot of evidence. And you can also check out in County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, this program or initiative that was developed called What Works for Health. And you can go in there and find evidence-based strategies that rural health communities or rural communities can use to again, boost health for everyone and close gaps for those who are marginalized. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to my man, Josh, so he can take us further. 
Thank you, Lawrence. Um, that was really helpful to set the context and to provide some important clues and, and data for us. And um, when we get to the discussion, I know we are keep us on time here, but I'm going to ask you to sort of how do we take that data and make it real and practical and, and use that. Um, but as we look forward to our next presentation, I'm really excited because as Lawrence is ending right here on some of these important strategies, we're now going to hear about a real practical, innovative, bold goal that has been set to improve health in rural communities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Josh to kick us off. Well, hi, everyone. And uh, yeah, well, well done, Lawrence. He's definitely set the stage of uh, really understanding the challenge that rural has across America. And I think what I'm going to do is present on, OK, so now what? So uh, what are you going to do about it? And a little story that we, uh, we're doing here is as, as a public hospital district uh, to really transform the health of our population uh, despite these significant challenges, uh, as well as how we've responded and innovated and innovating through COVID-19. So um, if you'd mind pulling up my PowerPoint. Perfect, so to give a little backdrop, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, Grace Harbor County is located in Western Washington. We serve a population of about 75,000 in total. Uh, we're about 76% Medicaid, Medicare, and that was all pre-COVID. Uh, we assume Medicaid is only gonna go up in rural based on uh, the trends we're seeing with some of the unemployment rates and other factors. Um, Grace Harbor County, about 17% of our population live below the federal poverty level. And we use a scoring system called Health Factors uh, that ranks kind of quality of life and length of life. And our county ranks 36 out of 39. Uh, we were 38 out of 39 about two years ago. So the good news is we're going up. Um, however, we still are uh, struggling with some very appalling statistics in that uh, Grace Harbor County residents on average will die three years sooner than any other resident in the state of Washington. Additionally, about 27% of our youth between the ages of uh, 13 and 17 struggle with uh, depression, anxiety, and 7% have reported using heroin. Uh, as you know, heroin isn't an entry drug. You don't just wake up one morning and start using. The realization is it starts at its onset, that maybe, maybe uh, is generational. So despite all these factors, um, we, we really took a step back as a board five years ago and said, we, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain. How do we really truly turn the model upside down because whatever we're doing isn't working? And we established a new vision. And you can go to the next slide. And this vision uh, is, is absolutely bold. It, it requires us to be innovative and disruptive. Uh, and the analogy that I use is like JFK, uh, we're electing to go to the moon, not because it's easy, because it's hard. And that statement required us as a society to really innovate and design and transform the way that we, we did things. And so our vision um, is through Summit Care, we will build the healthiest community in the nation. Uh, and through that, we've built, uh, a, a, I would say our rocket ship is our transformational wellness center that we built um, uh, two years ago. It was completely funded by the US Department of Agriculture, $33 million facility. But to Lawrence's point, we built this with the intent that we wanted to create access. How do we, how do we grow and create more access to, to our services uh, that has about 50% less than any other county in the state? But when we did that, we really want to make sure we approach it as a holistic, uh, integrated team-based approach, tying in food, nutrition, mental health, exercise, and focusing on the whole patient, the whole family, and the whole community in a holistic approach to care. And in our vision, we realize that we also need our community along with us. We cannot build the healthiest community without them. And so the intent of really changing this vision and our model is about bringing our community together around shared purpose and well-being. Of course, the way to do that, uh, next slide, is we recognize that uh, we have to change the way we think about healthcare and move the model from a sick care delivery model to a healthcare. So we built a playground, uh, we put a, I have to tell a quick story about the playground. I had one community member, which is interesting and rural, says, what in the world is a hospital doing building a playground? And I said, you're absolutely right. In a sick care delivery model, why aren't we building more ER bays or inpatient rooms? But in a healthcare delivery model, why are we not focusing on the family? In this, we, we added a splash pad for kids and the number of kids that come out of their appointment uh, running into the splash pad is just, it's, it's hilarious, but it's also quite, uh, um, telling 
we had one one child run into the splash pad, uh, you know, after their scheduled appointment, and said, "Mom, do we have to leave?" And the mother said, "Jimmy, this isn't a hotel." The point is, though, is that we wanted to create a place where kids are excited to go to engage around being well, not just a place to go when you're sick. You can go to the next slide. We realize that this is a journey though. And the best analogy I can use is we're like Sherpas leading our community that has never been there before. They, they didn't know that they wanted a wellness center. There's no way for them to know that. Nobody does. This is uncharted territory. So the realization is we have to build it and give them a desire to understand how to live with it and live within this, this vision. And so it's like climbing Mount Everest. I mean, the fastest way to the top is a straight line, but it's the highest chance of failure and mortality and death. And so we don't want to look at this as, you know, sprinting to the top. This is about zigging and zagging. We need to go left and zig right. And sometimes we have an avalanche, COVID-19. How are we going to innovate and make sure that we get our community safely to the top with us? And there's two major challenges with this. The first is this realization that I've come to this understanding <clears throat> that as a healthcare industry, we spend more time, resources, and funding resuscitating the canary at the hip of the minor to get the minor back to work. That is our healthcare system. Let's treat the symptom as opposed to understanding the disease or where it's coming from. Where is the toxic poisonous cloud originating from? And let's treat that. And actually let's take a step further and prevent it to create a better environment for the minor. But in rural, I think you have to realize that we're dealing with, it's generational. So what we do is we say, how do we take the minor out of the cavern in its entirety, which is about lifestyle, choice. Can we give our community choice to live a lifestyle that they don't understand or maybe have yet to experience? If you see your mom opening a bag of Doritos for 18 years, what do you think you're gonna teach your kids? Whether it's smoking, obesity, diabetes, it's all that's prevalent is based on choice. The other major challenge we have is the realization that there's no funding in transformation. Uh, the analogy I use that really describes our industry is Wayne Gretzky, who says, don't skate where the puck is, skate where the puck is going. The realization that I have is our puck is our industry is going out of control. We are addicts of sick care. And this, this came more obvious during COVID-19 that hospitals wanted to go back to the way that things have always been that we could not survive without sick care because of COVID-19, we had to postpone or prolong or put off necessary or needed surgeries or interventions. So we are addicts and we have to change it. And the question becomes is, can we focus on prevention and well-being enough to keep our patients out of our hospitals, but that is healthcare. So I'm gonna take that analogy and say, instead of skating where the puck is going, let's skate where we want the puck to be and create that delivery model. And let's involve our payer partners and our patients to create a whole new environment, a whole new skating ring. And that's what we're doing. So uh, I wanted to kind of talk about what COVID-19 has done and, and has impacted, or actually I think maybe even amplified our efforts. We realized that as rural hospitals, we not only had to address the epidemic uh, in itself that we had to respond to the crisis by treating patients and the significant burden that put in rural, this realization that hospitals felt like we were drowning. Our heads are underwater. We have to respond to all this, to this crisis. Uh, and we're waiting for somebody to come rescue us. There was realization though in rural, we are the Coast Guard. Rural hospitals are the lifeline. We have to pull our head out of water and lead and guide our community through this crisis. And this realization that we have an under, under, um, undertow, which I'm calling the crisis within the crisis, that after COVID-19, we're gonna deal with unemployment and poverty and disease and depression. And we have to start addressing that now, or we're gonna deal with it on the back end for generations. So now is the time we need to really double down and focus on, our, on, on these investments. So the way that we did this is we, we put our people at the center uh, going into this crisis. We made sure that our work environment was safe for our employees, a place that they would wanna come that doesn't cause more stress than they have outside of work. We wanted to really invest with our community through events. Uh, so we, we focused on doing wellness kits uh, and we did virtual support groups, provider educational classes uh, with our naturopathic providers or our nutritionists. We did a ladies night out virtual event where you said, come wine and dine and have some dinner with us. We'll provide you some education about women's health. Uh, we did a virtual 5K fun run with the intent that we wanted to get our community together, but do it virtually. 
Additionally, we leveraged our technology and focused on uh, building um, uh, virtual care. So we offset our primary care visits with virtual technology. And we did that within a matter of two weeks, we had a virtual care telemedicine program up and running. Our board met over the summer, and this is the time where I said, we're the lifeguard. We really need to think about where we need to swim and lead our community. We really revisit our vision and our mission statement and recreated our agile manifesto, which is how are we gonna lead through this change and how are we gonna model the leadership and behaviors we need to see in others uh, and lead by example. Additionally, we changed our big goal 2023, which is our commitment. And our commitment is that uh, by 2023, Sun Pacific will identify and cultivate relationships with community partners that share commitment to create measure improvements in health and well-being in our youth. We focus that right now our youth are struggling and uh, we need to create access for them uh, and, and more innovative ways to, to address um, social determinants. We also doubled down on value transformation. Um, we had a lot of hospitals questioning where they wanted to go in or out of an ACO or different payment models. I said, we need to double down on value. Uh, we need to start investing in prevention and population health and start to get upstream of any disease or conditions that we're gonna have to deal with on the back end. So we, we joined into a new ACO. Uh, we're actually hiring more staff. We committed not to laying off anybody. Uh, we created PPP for our, for our, um, uh, for our own employees, uh, created some healthy food packs and meals, and we provided childcare service so we wanted to make sure that uh, we doubled down on value and investing in our people. I would say the last thing I would share on, on uh, you know, leading into the future, something we're really thinking about is uh, focusing on a food prescription program, knowing that our community is struggling with hunter, hunger and access to food. We're looking at uh, transfer, transformation programs. We want to have an urgent care mobile clinic uh, funded by the CARES dollars. So that way we can actually go to employers, work sites, and do COVID-19 assessments or mobile urgent cares taking our hospital and becoming more like Netflix and going out to the consumer where they live, where they work, where they go to school and intersect with them there. And rural is the best position to do that because we have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Next slide. So lastly, I would say what's really helped us in COVID-19 uh, through this transformation is local, state and federal was vital for response in, in addressing COVID-19. But the challenge in this realization that our state and national governments are so focused on COVID-19 the same way that they're focused on the opioid epidemic, which is how do we treat the disease? How do we treat those that struggle with addiction or how do we treat COVID-19? There's little resources, funding or effort focused on prevention or how do we get upstream of it? So uh, the challenge that we have right now is how do we find funding uh, to help us identify prevention as a result of COVID-19? Uh, all the all the disease and, and higher acuity that will come out of this. Um, I think some of our payer partnerships were vital. We leaned on our, our payer partners, Medicaid uh, predominantly, to help us invent, invest in some of the transformational efforts. You know, they look at it from reducing costs of care that if they don't invest today on the front end and help us invest in prevention by hiring a nutritionist or a health coach or care coordinator, then they're going to have to pay tenfold on the back end when that uh, individual has a higher cost of care and is a frequent utilizer of our emergency room. So leveraging that payer partner is vital. And grants, I mean, we, we are a significant believer in grants. Uh, grants help us to launch our, our new residency family medicine program, the intent that we wanna create more access by growing our own providers. We received a grant for building that. We also received a grant for building a, a medication, a, a MAT clinic for those struggling with addiction and getting 100% of our providers certified in Suboxone treatment and therapy. So we, we are a firm believer that grants, at least for rural, can help us cross the chasm to find a more viable, sustainable way of population health. And lastly, I'll say is, is don't lose your foundations. Uh, people want to give to healthcare. This is our 9-11, but I guarantee we're gonna quickly forget. We need to leverage our legislators, tell our story frequently and often and make sure that uh, people know that we have frontline heroes, nurses, caregivers, environmental service techs, all of us that are leading this leading our rural communities. And we need to make sure that uh, we're, we're doing our best to sustain after this crisis. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Kara. Thank you so much, Josh. And one of the questions that we had, if you could just clarify really quickly what a, an ACO is, Accountable Care Organization? Yes, it's an account, uh, Accountable Care Organization. And, and in the quick 
quick, uh, we get funding and risk. We're taking on risk as an organization. So amidst crisis, you know, hospitals are losing money. I say we need to double down and, and invest in, in taking on more risk to manage some of the most vulnerable population in our community, which is our Medicare population. Those that are struggling with isolation, depression, and disease are the highest cost uh, utilizers. And the ACO will help us to really start investing in more population health strategies and integrated team-based approach to treat those Medicare beneficiaries members uh, to reduce cost of care, improve quality and length of life. Uh, so we're going into this next year, uh, going all in with risk in taking on this ACO endeavor. Thank you so much. Um, and so we're gonna pivot as, as Josh talked about in terms of you know, so much of what happens and outcomes in people's health is related to things that are not happening in that healthcare setting and the importance of understanding the relationship between a lot of those social factors, health behaviors, as he talked about, um, food and security and housing and transportation. And so we're gonna pivot now to hear a little bit more about what's happening in a community um, that has you know, lost the hospital that has been really innovative in trying to meet the needs of um, the food insecurity there. So I'm gonna turn it over to Maria and I'm also gonna ask as uh, Maria is going through her presentation, if you guys wanna start putting your questions in, in the Q&A for those of you who've already been doing that, please continue to do so. But um, we will go from here into uh, Q&A afterwards with the panelists. So Maria, go ahead. Thank you, Kara. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you um, for joining us today. My name is Maria, and I am the immediate past director of community agriculture for the Williamson Health and Wellness Center. Um, I do currently still do some contract work for them, but I'm also a full-time um, Master of Public Health graduate student at Cornell University. So I'm working from home in West Virginia. So if a train comes by, I apologize. Um, so the Williamson Health and Wellness Center is located in Mingo County, West Virginia, which is on the border of Eastern Kentucky on the southernmost part of the state. Um, I'm gonna give an overview of some of the work that the Wellness Center has done both pre and post COVID. Uh, but first I wanted to give sort of an overview of the population. It really echoes uh, some of the points that Lawrence made in his in introduction um, regarding the challenges uh, that Appalachians face. Um, the population consists of many high risk groups, which right now is really important um, because they are more susceptible to complications of COVID-19. But there are about 24,000 people in Mingo County and almost a quarter of the population is over the age of 65. According to the Robert Wood Johnson um, County Health Rankings, 37% of the population is considered obese and 28% of Mingo County residents report fair or poor health. And in addition to this, um, there are a number of other challenges that have been mentioned already. There's high unemployment rates, high rates of substance abuse, and almost a quarter of residents are food insecure. And this has likely increased as a result of the pandemic. So in 2011, Williamson Health and Wellness Center opened uh, to address some of these health issues. And it is a federally qualified health clinic uh, that focuses on a holistic health approach. They offer a number of different health services. This includes adult medicine, pediatrics, podiatry, dentistry, behavioral health, and there's also a medically assisted treatment center uh, for substance abuse. And the wellness center also just opened a sister um, organization on the far, other far end of the county. So they are expanding. And in addition to the more standard health services that I just mentioned, the Wellness Center um, has a pretty robust community outreach wing, uh, which we call Healthy in the Hills. And this has both physical activity and healthy eating programs. And I, of course, um, worked mostly with the healthy eating programs, but I'm familiar with uh, some of the others as well. So the physical activity team hosts mon monthly 5Ks, group runs, a walk with ease program that targets senior citizens, and walking programs that are more um, competition-based. And they also host a marathon uh, pre-COVID that brings about a thousand runners to the area uh, annually, which is a huge tourism booster. For the healthy eating programs that I helped manage, there's a farmer's market that runs uh, throughout the summer, a mobile market that travels to different parts of uh, the county to address food insecurity a Farm Fresh to You program that's a community supported agriculture 
where um, participants sign up for a box and they uh, receive produce throughout the summer. We also do prescription vegetables. Um, I know someone mentioned that earlier and we host a community garden as well. And these projects really increase food security uh, to at-risk populations, but they also create economic diversification. Uh, the Williamson Farmers Market projects support about 25 local farmers and the sales are typically over $75,000 um, annually. And that's just over the summer months. The Wellness Center also hosts uh, volunteer groups from around the world and is home to AHEC, which is the Area Health Education Center. Um, and this is an opportunity that connects high school and college students to the clinic that are interested in careers in healthcare. And so since uh, the beginning, the Wellness Center has really been this anchor institution in the community. Uh, it currently employs more than 100 people, which is one of the largest employers in the city. Um, and it provides financial and human capital to support the area's uh, community health improvement journey. So it's been really a great opportunity working for them. Uh, but when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in the spring, it was one of the only health centers in the area. Um, several of the previous speakers have um, addressed uh, the fact that hospitals are closing across the country. And this was true in Williamson as well. It closed in the winter, uh, right before the pandemic hit. And while the Wellness Center has purchased the hospital um, as of April, it's still been going through this transition period. And so the Wellness Center was really um, leaned upon for information and support during the pandemic. Uh, West Virginia was one of the last states to report uh, a COVID case, but now um, it's really running rampant in the community. Um, on a, November 11th, uh, West Virginia reported the highest single day deaths and the positivity rate uh, was 9.5% as of like two days ago. And that's actually down from 15%. Um, and West Virginia replicates the Harvard Glo Global Health Institute COVID-19 map. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, it's got a co color coding system to represent the various uh, positivity rates. And Mingo County has been read uh, consistently for several weeks. So uh, as a result of this, there's been other additional challenges that the Wellness Center has faced, um, uh, not including the hospital closure. Uh, in the spring, there was limited staff capacity due to quarantines and a reduction in hours among team members. In order to slow the spread and maintain a healthy workforce, the Wellness Center implemented an employee rotation. So some of the staff was working part of the week while the other staff was um, working the remaining half. And other effects of the pandemic, it's sort of been this like ripple effect in the community um, as in many other places across the country um, where businesses were shut down for a few months um, in an area that's already economically depressed. Some of them have um, closed permanently. Unfortunately, the schools have been closed for several weeks. So the youth um, in the area is really st struggling right now. And finally, um, as a result of increased unemployment rates, uh, food insecurity has really increased and food banks are seeing uh, more requ requests right now than they can handle. So to address some of these issues, the Williamson Health and Wellness Center has come up with some innovative solutions. Sorry, I just had to take a sip of water. Um, the, they are offering testing sites currently throughout the county um, in partnership with the Mingo County Health Department. And these are free testing sites that are open to anyone, um, whether you're showing symptoms or not. And this is really important right now where there are so many cases in the area. Additionally, they're working with the health department to conduct contract tracing. And um, one other thing that I thought was uh, sort of interesting that they did was to address the limited staff capacity. They pulled community health workers from the field uh, to be COVID screeners and COVID testers. So since they weren't going into the homes of their patients, um, they were needed more uh, to be screeners. So that was one of the things that they did. And then to serve all patients, there's been an increased um, telehealth visits and chronic care management encounters. And then I just briefly wanted to talk about some of the um, healthy eating initiatives that we've started since uh, the pandemic began um, in May. 
when businesses were closed, restaurants were closed, schools were closed, uh, there was a large number of people that did not have access uh, to the amount of food that they typically did. So we started a pull up for produce and meal kit program. Um, customers could order the food ahead of time online and then go to the farmer's station safely and effectively handed their um, meal kit and produce bag. And this was also available to low income families. We have a really large um, SNAP stretch program that's supported by some uh, state and federal funders. And if a customer makes a purchase with their SNAP card, we're able to match it. So if they were buying the pull up for produce bag, they were essentially getting it for 50% off. And this was also available at the farmer's market and mobile market. So if they were spending $10 on their SNAP card, they um, were eligible to receive $10 back to um, use to buy other fresh fruits and vegetables at the market. We also shifted most of our education classes to a virtual learning platform. So we were able to do some physical activity um, engagements online, but we also did cooking classes, um, nutrition classes. And then I also just wanted to emphasize that the physical activity team started a hiking program to encourage some new outdoor activity engagements where you could maintain social distancing and still um, be able to be physically active. So all of this was made possible with a number of different partners um, and funding opportunities. And even though it has been a really challenging time, we have been able to be that um, sort of anchor institution in the community. And, look forward to continuing to serve in the future. So if anyone has any questions for AFCA, I look forward to hearing them. Sorry, just trying to get myself off mute. Thank you so much, Maria. We did have one clarifying question. Could you define prescription veggies for the group, please? Yeah, so um, originally this was something that we implemented with the high-risk diabetic patients. Uh, the community health workers that were visiting the homes of high-risk diabetics were um, provided a voucher that they could spend either at the farmer's market or to be used on the Farm Fresh to You um, Community Supported Agriculture Program. So it was basically a financial incentive for them to eat healthy that was prescribed by their physician. Thank you. So um, we've heard three uh, really good presentations and um, I'm going to ask in a minute, I'm going to hope we can get through some rapid fire questions. But before we begin with those, I'm wondering, um, Lawrence, if you could talk a little bit about your story briefly about how you've been able to make the data actionable, because I think that's one of the things data is great to help tell a story, but how do you actually use that? And I think you've got a, a great story to share if you could briefly do that. And then I'm gonna turn to our Sherpas, which I, I love that analogy, Josh. So I'm gonna, you all are our Sherpas to advise here to ask you for the audience and some of the questions that have come up relate to how do you get these partners on board and particularly leading and engaging in some places where this may be a challenge. So um, Lawrence, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll open it up for each of you to kind of respond to that guiding aspect for our, our audience. Well, I, you know, in June, my grandparents who live in Crittenden County, Arkansas, both of them contracted the COVID virus or the novel coronavirus and led to COVID. And so uh, being very concerned about their welfare, of course, uh, I went down and my grandfather was hospitalized. And of course, when folks are hospitalized with COVID, they're isolated. So your families aren't able to go and visit uh, their loved ones. And so I, I thought about, well, what could I do and I decided to put my training to use, partner with the Arkansas State NAACP, the Crittenden County branch of the NAACP. And we use data from the US COVID Atlas, which is put out by the University of Chicago. And we were able to show from that website, which is a tremendous resource because it shows COVID cases, case rates, all kind of data uh, for the 3000 plus counties across America. And we showed that counties in the Arkansas Delta all were spiking at that time, um, including Shelby County, uh, Tennessee, the home of Memphis across the Mississippi River, which is where many Arkansans would go to be hospitalized because many of those rural counties 
um, had very small amounts of hospital beds. So that was really the overflow in another state. So we needed to look and see, well, were they spiking as well? And they were, which meant that if their hospitals filled up, that was gonna be a big challenge for the counties in the Arkansas Delta. Um, I should mention that we also looked at those hospitals and we saw first that Lee County, Arkansas had no hospital. And that's another issue. Some rural counties have hospitals that close. Some rural counties don't have a hospital at all. And so there's, we were able to see all of that with the data. We convened a press conference. We uh, compelled and called upon Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson to really develop a plan that could address the rising concerns that we had. And thankfully the reporters went and asked him questions and he responded. Uh, he actually sent the branch of uh, Crittenden County NAACP a letter acknowledging the questions that we were asking and saying that he was, him and his team and his administration were thinking very critically and, and putting resources in place for the Arkansas Delta. So I like to think of that as uh, a, an advocacy success story. And thankfully my grandparents recovered. My grandfather came out of the hospital uh, and he's been recovering uh, since then. So uh, I think that's one way you can, where these rural small, smaller counties, sometimes I think we have to step in and augment some of their efforts uh, because like I said earlier, the capacity may not be there. Yeah, can Thank I, you. Can I Go ahead, Josh. that as well? Yeah, yep. this is the area that I'm, I'm quite passionate about and, and it's not because I have an answer. Uh, in fact, it's because we don't have an answer that gives me motivation. Uh, and the fact is that people often ask, you know, Josh, by investing in prevention, aren't you putting yourself out of business? And the answer is yes, uh, successfully. Uh, the more you invest in keeping people out of your hospital uh, and doing what's right, uh, actually is, doesn't pay the bills. And the truth is, is that uh, as we think about moving the, the investment from, we think of a stratification scale where one is low cost, uh, maybe it's you know birth you know to five highest cost of care. The statistics are you know this the highest utilizers, the lowest percentage of the highest cost um, utilizers, and, and the amount of investment we spend in treating level fives from you know disease and higher acuity and end of life care. Imagine if we took that investment and invested it in a three, right? An individual that is probably in their thirties or forties. If they continue on this lifestyle, they're going to be a, a higher cost of care at a lower length of life. Imagine if we shift the cost curve to an investment in prevention and upstreaming in stratification, we wanna measure that. An example of that is when we think about a holistic integrated team-based approach to care, we wanna have a mental health practitioner and a pharmacist and a health coach and a nutritionist. The realization is the only way you can bill for a nutritionist is if you already have a disease. If you believe food is medicine, what you put in your body we should be billing for nutritionists for outpatient consultation to pre prevent diabetes. And so what we wanna measure is can we identify and stratify the cost of care with those threes and fours by an investment? And the challenge is, is we haven't found the money or the partnership to do it. So what we're doing is we're gonna set up our own, build our own research institute uh, in partnership with our academic residency program to start researching and studying the investment of an integrated holistic team-based approach to care that we can demonstrate savings and hopefully make something more sustainable. Thank you. So um, I'm mindful of time, so I'm hoping we can get a couple of questions in here. So the first question, I've seen a number of people who've written in about how you guys are addressing the social determinants of health. And clearly, Maria, with food, you, you're doing that, but other issues in terms of childcare, transportation, um, or any of the, the adverse childhood events as well. So. Well, I guess I'll say, you know, I think, you know, we talk about social determinants of health and I think that's great and wonderful, but I think we don't talk a lot about public health itself, the system of public health, the fact that it's so deeply underfunded in America, somebody had a question about religious hospitals and it made me think about you know, the lack of funding for public hospitals. So I think the way we think about funding health fundamentally that these systems are often very weak. And when you have a rural county with a low tax base, a declining population and 
you know, economic development that relies on that, those numbers that the developers and uh, that different corporations use to decide whether or not they're going to locate in a, in a specific location, it's clear that, you know, private approaches can't always do the job. And so we have to think, you know, the HEROES Act, for instance, that has to be passed you know, I talked about in the chat, you know, the need for a standing, well-paid, nationally recognized community health worker core that can go out into our communities, that can do a lot of the things that we need public health to do in the middle of a pandemic and the opioid syndemic crisis that we're facing. You get, we have to have funding and we have to figure out how we're gonna advocate in a much more powerful way as rural counties and as a country for our counties that are in need. And I'll, I'll take the uh, uh, child care and housing just very briefly. Uh, housing is a very complex issue and I get approached frequently about, you know, would the hospital be willing to step in to address housing? And, and unfortunately, I have to be really honest, my answer is no. Um, and the reason why is you can't address housing without addressing food and poverty and employment, mental health, and otherwise we're a hero for five minutes and it's not enough. And so we, we cannot really step into this and we can't do it alone. We need community partners and coalitions to really say, what is a, a, a community approach to address the whole spectrum that isn't just a surface level fix that create, it's, it's just more of a paradoxical equation where now we've just, we've solved transitional housing, but haven't prevented the opioid addiction or mental health or creating jobs. Uh, the other challenge, and not saying we're not working on it, but this is a long endeavor. Um, childcare is something uh, very important we realize that for us to recruit and retain employees in rural, we have to address childcare uh, and, and employers need it too. And so it's this symbiotic relationship that healthcare needs to step in. And so what we did is we looked at old space buildings we had, uh, facilities, we looked at grants, aligning local government and agency to bring together with an intent to create childcare. And we, we received a grant for about 750,000 to build a new childcare agency across the street from the hospital, which will give prime access to our employees um, to recruit, retain, but then the other great side of it is then we can start impacting nutrition and exercise and and you know and lifestyle with this whole kind of community-based approach to childcare. Thank you. And um, last question before I'm going to ask you to leave some advice for our, our audience in terms of how they can work. I've seen a number of questions related to how broad does your partnership extend in each, for both you, particularly Josh and Maria, in terms of does it include community-based partnership, community-based organizations? Are you working with um, sort of the private sector, others, philanthropy? Like how, how big is your coalition and maybe how did you get them to the table? Um, the Wellness Center actually started um, something several years ago called Community Conversations. And it was where um, partners in the community just got together to talk about different issues that the community was facing and ways to address this problem. And I think that was something that really helped strengthen our community-based partnerships. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we work with a number of different organizations and in rural communities, I think that is one of the most important things um, to consider when thinking about success. Um, you wouldn't be able to host large marathons or events or cooking class without support of um, partner organizations. So, but that is one idea to get people to the table is to talk to them about what they need and um, to come together to pool resources and make change happen. Thank you. And did that include some of the private businesses as well in your community? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Josh? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, our, our vision requires community collaboration. Uh, JFK didn't build the rocket ship to the moon. You know, he had, he had a nation, he had engineers, designers, builders, dreamers, uh, and that's no different than our vision. What I love about our vision, it gives us permission to fail. Uh, and we failed a lot at this, um, which is how, how not to include partners, when to include them, and this realization that they have competing priorities and limited resources. You know, the school is motivated by graduation rates. How do we get them to, to focus on health scores and mental health days for their students? And so the, the, what we've done is we've developed a coalition and really focused on community asset mapping. Uh, through a, a subcommittee of our board, we developed from elected official to elected official, we can bring together more influence and in legislative change. But the key is that not everyone is on board with our vision and that's okay but how do we create a shared purpose, something that we can work in collaboration around, focusing on a measurement 
uh, to Lawrence's point that let's focus on a measurement that we can impact. How do we, what can we do to, to, to meet that and do that collectively as, as a community and start there. And that's maybe that first leg of our journey. And then we'll, we'll meet that big goal and then we'll deviate and focus on the next big leg and take it a piece at a time. That's the only way we're gonna get long lasting sustainable change. Thank you. Okay. So in the 30 second advice that you have before we go to the breakout sessions, and for those of you, I know we didn't get to all of the questions, but we'll be able to continue some of this in the breakout. So for each of you as a panelist, what is, you know, for someone out here, what is one thing you would recommend that they do if they're trying to get started or advance in this space? Um, and I will also just share while you're thinking about that, and I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Lawrence, before we, we do that. Um, I chatted into the space. I didn't talk about, you know, sort of the role that philanthropy has played in this time, but philanthropy has also been very involved in helping communities work together and um, providing both PPE, working to help people access state and federal resources. So I know I saw a question in there about some of the smaller communities being able to apply for grants for some of that, as well as helping to collaborate. So um, you can learn more about that uh, through a report that we shared. And um, Lawrence, your 30 second advice for the group. Sure, my advice is you know, to think about macroeconomics for rural counties because many rural counties went into a downward spiral when manufacturing was lost, when jobs went overseas or, or elsewhere. And so you had people that lost not only income, but a sense of identity. And that's what is triggering not only the opioid crisis, but suicides and you know that the whole plethora of health outcomes that I think are spiking right now. So I think that's the thing. Think macro, not just micro. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I would say, uh, despite what your uh, first grade teacher told you, I, I dare you to be disruptive. Um, I call it deliberate disruption. If we're not disrupting, we will be disrupted. And I think rural is in a great position to innovate, to dream, to design to turn the model upside down, to demonstrate and improve uh, impact uh, and then drive transformation uh, because, because we have nothing to lose and everything to innovate. So uh, don't, don't be afraid of it. And, uh, and as uh, I said in one of my quotes, you know, Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wanna see in the world. Uh, I want a healthcare system that focuses on giving length of life uh, for my generation, the next generation, my kids and grandkids uh, because the model today isn't working. And if we don't fix it, who will? Thank you, and Maria. Yeah, I think um, when I was thinking about this before the presentation, the number one um, thing that I had considered was building partnerships. But the other thing I would mention is that it takes time. Like this process in Williamson has been ongoing for about 10 years now, and um, it's taken that long to really get where we are. And then also um, utilize your early adopters and people with lived experience. Um, that was really the core group of people in Williamson that tackled the issues and um, got things off the ground, so. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Aspen Institute and all of the partners who helped to make today possible. And I'm gonna thank our panelists for a great conversation and great discussion. And we'll turn it back over to our, our fearless leaders at Aspen. Thanks. Uh, the link to the breakout room is now in the chat box. Please head on over.